after a grand total of 3,600 miles over the course of 16 days, 90 hours of driving, we have reached the furthest north that you can possibly drive in all of North America. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the top of the world, Dead Horse, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. After making that journey all the way up here, you get to the end of the road, and this is what you get to see. It's a sign with a dead horse on it, marking the end of the road. But it's more than just a sign. All the travelers who have made the journey all the way up here come and pay homage to this location right here by leaving their mark on the wall by putting a sticker on it. So you can stand here and look at all the travelers who've made this long, long journey all the way up here to the top of the world through some of the most remote territory in all of North America. It's not just a matter of coming up here to see the sign. It's a matter of saying that you've accomplished what few have done by making it all the way to the top of the world. In 2009, I had just started with the company and my boss asked me to hang these signs up and uh, no stickers, not one sticker on them. No one had really done anything with them. And over the years, it just one person started to sticker, a decal, a plaque, a memorial. And now it, this wall is just covered in decals. It's a real destination for uh, travelers coming up here. Waking up here this morning, the temperature is minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's basically the same in Celsius as well. It's cold, it's barren out here. But this little town of Dead Horse is a crazy bustling little industrial town that is up here for the black gold of oil. This whole entire town of Dead Horse and Prudhoe Bay do not exist without oil. Humans do not exist up here without oil. The sole purpose of anything being up here is oil. Everybody that's up here is here to do one thing and that is work. I mean, there is not so much as a restaurant in town there's no cafe there are no bars matter of fact there is no alcohol allowed in the town of dead horse if you are caught with alcohol you are either fired kicked out or asked to leave they are that serious about it after making the trek all the way up here i figured might as well settle into the area for at least a day or two and get to know a little bit about what life must be like up here. I've been able to chat with a few locals, some that have been here for 15 plus years, and it has been very intriguing just to sit down and listen to the stories, a slice of what life is like. My name is Terry White. We are in Dead Horse, also goes by the name of Prudhoe Bay. Geographically, it's like three miles from the Arctic Ocean. I think it's 46 below wind chill right now, which is comfortable. Dead Horse is an oil field town. It's just all oil field workers. Although nobody can live here, they come, they go, we do our hitches. I work a 21 day on, 21 day off. So 2112s fly back to the Pacific Northwest. I live in Montana and then uh, do it all again. About nine hitches a year. We can get blows of 60, 70 mile an hour winds. 80 below wind chill will get a, a phase condition to the point where you can't see me to you. 
that's when it really gets dangerous. There's no movement, people hunker down, shelter in place. Wherever you're at, you just stay there until that blow gets by you. Nothing wants to run, nothing wants to stay running. If a truck dies, you get a flat tire. Every job that in the summer would take you an hour, takes you five hours in the winter. This is how bad it really can get. I spent some time in Arizona. At 115 above, you start up your rig to cool it down. Up here, you start up your rig to, uh, to warm it up. 115 above and 30 below are real similar. It's really hard to survive at 115, and you can't survive at 30 below. This whole entire region is basically considered an Arctic desert. It only receives 10 inches of precipitation per year, which is crazy to think about. We think that, oh, the Arctic's gotta have feet and feet and feet of snow, but really there isn't that much snow. The ground is barely covered. I'm looking out here across the tundra and I can see vegetation coming up through. Anywhere we see accumulations of snow in and around town is all brought in by the wind. The wind can become so extreme out here. Even a stop sign will create a giant snow drift behind it overnight because it's enough to interrupt the wind and it creates a snow drift. As I drive around town, a lot of the equipment, a lot of the structures have snow built up around it. And that is just simply because of the blowing and the snow that accumulates around anything that interrupts the wind. While I'm able to drive freely here in Dead Horse, which is a whole bunch of construction companies, it's a bunch of industrial companies here to supply the oil fields, anything north of here is completely shut down and that is where the big oil camps are. A lot of the laydown yards in Dead Horse house a lot of the equipment that has been pulled off of the oil fields, either stored here for future projects or that are completely out of commission and eventually will be hauled out of here. It is very reminiscent of what you might see in Mad Max, just these giant metal structures that you could tell at one point were either an oil rig or some sort of industrial piece of equipment that was responsible for drilling the oil out of the earth up here. It's almost apocalyptic feeling in certain ways, especially this time of year where the snow will just encrust itself on these abandoned structures up here. It's crazy to be standing here face to face with such an immense structure to think that at one point, every piece of this piece of equipment here was hauled by truck down the haul road of the Dalton Highway from God knows where it was actually fabricated, but in pieces it made its way down the haul road all the way up here into the middle of nowhere. This at one point would have been a fully operational oil drill rig and it is portable. That's exactly why the winter time becomes so productive for oil companies is because the ground is so frozen this time of year, they're actually able to hook trucks up to these immense structures and actually haul them out across the tundra, sometimes 10, 20, 30, 40, even up to 60 miles out across the frozen Arctic Ocean to be able to set up drill sites and drill for oil. You can see many of these oil rigs scattered along the horizon. Not only are they here in the actual town of Dead Horse, but they go for hundreds of miles out along the shore of the Arctic Ocean. Unfortunately, we don't have access to the Arctic Ocean this time of year because it's all on lockdown for the oil fields. The main operations of this whole north slope of Alaska lies north of here. 
And that is where the big oil camps are. It's basically a whole entire city at these construction camps. I hear stories of bowling alleys and movie theaters and these big atriums and there's palm trees that have gardeners that are there to maintain the gardens in these atriums and really just stuff that give the workers up here the opportunity to experience something different when their shifts are done and complete. Unfortunately, I'm not able to access any of that. It's all kept locked down under security behind gates. Well, this is normally the point that we'd be able to go access the Arctic Ocean, but there are no private vehicles, as the sign says here, allowed out on the oil fields. So therefore, this is the closest that we can get to the actual Arctic Ocean. We've driven all these miles, but yet we're just a few miles away from being able to see the actual ocean. There are no permanent homes up here. There's no apartments. You can't even get a P.O. box up here in the area. Basically, workers come up here for anywhere from two to three weeks at a time, and then they have two to three weeks off at a time, and they fly out of here and they fly back home to wherever they're from. So they really do that to stave off the craziness of what would happen, especially in the wintertime, of what it takes to come up here and work. I was just working through this edit and realized that you guys are probably having the exact same question that I had while I was cruising around up in Prudhoe Bay and I realized that I forgot to answer that question on camera while I was up there. You guys are wondering why all of these buildings are built on stilts and you might be thinking things like well maybe it floods up there which it doesn't or maybe they're protecting themselves from bears or wild animals which there are polar bears that do roam around up here and there are actually grizzly bears as well but that's not actually the reason why they've built these buildings on stilts. The reason why they have done this is because of the permafrost up there in the Arctic. In the winter time the ground becomes so cold that it actually becomes permanently frozen. As soon as mankind ended up up here in the tundra, they realized that any structures they built directly on the permafrost, it ended up actually thawing out the permafrost and it just becomes a muddy mess. So these big giant structures, they put them up on stilts so that the permafrost remains permanently frozen. If you didn't know, now you know. So it has really become quite the interesting experience uh, getting to chat with some of the locals and just drive around and see what things are like. In an effort to get the full experience of what it's like to be up here in Dead Horse, Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, I thought for this evening I would get a room at one of the local man camps, take in the full experience, see what life is actually like as a worker. I'm going to take you guys inside and show you what that's like as part of the whole entire experience. So let's jump on inside here and I'll show you guys uh, what that's all about. I want to show you guys this thing here. So if you guys see this structure, it actually runs the whole entire length of the parking lot. And you see these cords hanging down, just like I showed you guys at the other camp. These are where everybody plugs in their block heaters. We can see here this van here has got their block heater plugged in. And my oil pan heater, I plugged it in here. So the van is going to be kept nice and warm here. And that is the hotel over there. Let's go jump inside and see what that's all about because it is freaking cold out here. Okay, I'm making a run for it because it is cold. These whole camps remind me of like spaceships. I mean, they've got laundry rooms, they've got gyms. 
tons of rooms. Like behind it waiting for it coming at you? Well, this looks like it's going to be home for the night. The cozy little abode. Let's take a tour. For $140 a night, up here in the Arctic, this is what you get. Looks to be a nice, comfortable bed. A shower. Toilet. Over here, we got ourselves a nice little workspace. A TV. A window. Well, you know what? It's not very big. It ain't much, but to be honest with you, it is a welcome little mini vacation from the van. Now I'm used to living in my van full time, that's no big deal. The thing about this particular trip up here into this kind of weather in this kind of climate is the fact that you are in the van non-stop. There's been a lot of hours spent behind the wheel. There's been a lot of time just spent hunkered down in the van, living in the van full time, because when it's this cold out, you don't get the opportunity to go out and sit by the campfire. You don't get the opportunity to go out for a hike. You are in that van, sometimes 24 hours a day, with just barely stepping outside to fuel up. Getting to have the well-rounded experience of staying at one of the camps and seeing what camp life is all about this is a cool opportunity and a welcome break from the van so looking forward to just hunkering down here in my little mini abode and seeing what that's all about so with that $140 a night your meals are also included which is cool sounds like it's a buffet style cafeteria so I'm gonna go down and check that out see what it's all about Good morning guys just waking up here this morning got a great sunrise happening over the oil fields here and dead horse had a good night's sleep the bed actually surprisingly wasn't too bad I slept pretty darn good been working here this morning dumping some of the footage from the last couple days getting that all archived on the hard drive I did start the shower apparently it takes several minutes for the hot water to reach this far to my room. I'm gonna grab a shower here this morning, pack up and start heading south and start this adventure home. At this point, the journey is only halfway over. We still got all those miles to get back to Washington State. One of the things that has piqued my curiosity while being up here is what happens if and when the oil reserves up here actually run out. There are actually written agreements in place with the Inuit people who actually own all of this territory that once the oil is gone and the drilling is finished, that all the gravel that has been brought in, it all goes back to the gravel pits to fill those in. All of the structure, all of the buildings, all of the trucks, all the equipment, it all goes back to the way it was before mankind came out here in search of oil. That's crazy to think about. Everything's got to come back out of here, just like it made its way in here in the first place. Besides the truckers who make the route up here uh, on an almost daily basis, most people fly in, they fly out. People that have spent 15 years up here working have not actually driven the Dalton Highway. So to have made that 
trek across the Arctic and up here to this area, I feel very fortunate to have had that experience. And that just goes to show you how remote the Dalton Highway is. It's interesting to get a little bit of slice of life of what people go through when they come up here to work. 